So we are taking our inspiration for this three and 30 from the storied strings, the guitar in American art exhibition that is currently on view in the lower level galleries at the museum. Um, and that exhibition, for those of you who don't know, or those of you who have been there probably do know and remember that um, that exhibition really posits that the guitar is especially effective at um, kind of facilitating the telling of stories and ideas about the full American experience. Um, so it's a very rich exhibition um, centered on the guitar as a sort of storytelling device, if you will. And that, that idea of communication um, that is both visual and sonic is what we are going to explore this morning. Um, and really kind of look at the parallels um, in the way we talk about both composing music and composing artworks. Um, so Robert, why don't we dive right in here? Let's go. All right. Um, so Robert and I thought this would be a really nice place to start. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm really excited that Robert's joining me today. Um, we both have different backgrounds and different perspectives on um, how we interact with the artworks in the galleries at the museum. Um, Robert has an extensive musical background that I do not, so it's awesome to have him here today. Um, and the artist who is responsible for this large mural that is in the museum um, actually had some, some really cogent words about this idea of perspective. Um, he was talking and writing about the role of the artist. Um, so Saul LeWitt, who is the artist of this piece did say, um, once it is out of his hand, the artist has no control over how the viewer will perceive his work, perceive the work. Different people will understand the same thing in a different way. Um, and Robert, I mean, is it your, how does how does that kind of translate into how a composer might compose a musical piece and, and sort of give it to the audience? Yeah, so in composition, we, a lot like in art, we have um, an idea in our mind. Uh, in art, sometimes we draw a, a thumbnail, write a yeah. sketch of what's going to, what's going to come. In music, we do something similar. We write out what really looks like a formula, a series of numbers. And as we look at those numbers, we begin to assign notes to them based on the key that it's in. The composer, a lot like uh, Saul Witt here, writes down the notes on the page and it instructs the player uh, or the singer or the conductor how the piece of music should flow. Um, we see a lot of those elements. I want to let me back up and say when Sarah first brought me to this as our opening piece, Sarah, you'll recall, I said, okay, great. I don't see any music here <laughs> whatsoever. Um, with that difference in perspective and background, Sarah was able to educate me on some things that really changed the way that I saw this piece of work of art that I've seen 500, 600, a thousand times before. And it began to look very much to me like a symphony. I can't yeah. wait to get more into that. But we As, um, related to that, Robert, and I like what you're talking about. You're talking about this this writing of certain notes and sort of giving signals to those who will perform the work. Um, and I'm going to pop us into the gallery if I can for just a minute because um, let's see if I can be savvy and do this. Okay, hopefully in a moment we're going to be in the galleries in this 360 view. Um, so that you all can get a sense of how large this object is and the space it occupies. I can even turn around and show you, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the museum, that this object is within or close to our marble hall, which is a really large space used for many different things and gatherings of people. Um, and it's kind of at the entrance to the mid to late 20th, um, century art galleries coming from the direction of this marble hall. And Saul LeWitt um, was kind of the father of, or one of the very early um, proponents of something called conceptual art. And it was his contention, he actually likened artwork as Robert has just done um, to musical composition so that um, it's not that unlike composing a symphony or a piece of music that will be performed and that Solowit 
um, for these objects comes up with a with a seemingly very simple idea. In this case, um, the directions for putting this artwork on view are simply um, that this wall drawing number 541, which is the title of the piece, is on each of four walls, a tilted form with color ink washes superimposed. That's it. Um, there's a there's a recipe, if you will, for how these washes are applied to the wall, but that too is really quite simple. It's a matter of layering colors on top of one another um, in a very purposeful, careful way. But these super simple forms can be deceiving. So Robert, tell us a little bit more about your interaction in this space and I'll see if I can get us a little closer in here. Um, so I'll tell you all um, what really changed or not changed my mind, but opened my mind. Uh, that gave me the thoughts that I'm, I'm getting ready to share with you was that if you can look at one of the images, let's wait till Sarah lands on the one, That's the right one. one, this one right here. You can see that that point, oh, you can't see what I'm pointing at. That point in the middle where the, the three lines come together, the three colors and that angle, that point there, does it look to you viewers who can't respond to me right now, but does it look like it's going in or out? Is it pointing to you or is it inviting you into the space? And when she pointed that out to me, I began to see music everywhere in this piece of music, even though that it itself wasn't a very musical thought. This piece of, of art, this wall drawing in four pieces began to feel very much like maybe one of the highest forms of music, the symphony, in many different ways. The most obvious for me is that it happens in four parts. In music, we would call each of these panels a movement of its own. Um, right now, today, I woke up with Mozart Symphony 29 in my mind. So let's think about that one. Even in the naming of this piece, what did you say it was called, Sarah? It's called Wall Drawing Five, Number 541. That's very musical. I mean, we think about music, uh, Mozart Symphony number 29. That's that's its name. It's not called the Wallflower or something. It's given a number because that's the 29th symphony that he wrote. A piece of music like that is also done in layers, as we can see here. Sarah mentioned that this is uh, paint in layers. Uh, each of these colors becomes orange and green and red and, and whatever it turns into, but the painter is not using orange. The painter is layering color after color as prescribed by the wit until we reach that um, shade of orange or shade of red that we're going for. Similarly, the composer will layer strings upon strings upon strings and then woodwinds and woodwinds and brass and percussion until we have an entire piece of music. That sounds very complex, uh, but the violinist is just playing one note at a time. You know, they, they can't possibly play that whole thing and together it becomes a symphonic work of music. We can also see uh, different moods. You can't see what I'm pointing at. I keep my I'll hands on myself. I okay. know what you're going to do. I'll point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can see different moods in the uh, each panel itself. In Mozart 29, uh, we start with an allegro moderato. We move into an andante, a minuetto, and then an allegro conspirato. Those names sound very fancy, but really all they're doing is telling us the tempo and the texture, the mood, of the piece of music. In 29, we have an allegro at the beginning and an allegro at the end. The first one, moderata. Allegro would be kind of a spirited you know, term, uh, moderately spirited, Mozart prescribes. And by the end, it's spirited, uh, it's allegro, it's fast and a heightened sense of spirit. I see that here. I see, oh man, I keep pointing. You can't see what I'm pointing at. I see <laughs> in the first panel, a lot of joy in that orange. I see it against a very, gray background, which kind of says, what are, to me, what are we looking at? But by the end, I'm back to that Allegro movement with that red. Mm -hmm. Instead of at the top, I'm now at the bottom, we've sort of switched our mood. And I, I really appreciate Lewitt for giving me some musical cues there as well. We can also see themes in music. You may be interest, introduced into a motif. We can sort of see that here where he introduces the idea of blue and green and orange, right? And then we move on into the next panel and perhaps we've lost the green, perhaps we've lost the orange, but we keep that blue and we pick up now a red, a new theme 
to lead us onto the next piece of music. And then we drop some colors, the mood shifts with an, a yellow background and then to red, uh, giving us sort of a great arch, uh, arc, a pattern, a wave, a flow, uh, antecedent and a condecedent phrase that speak to one another. When we were standing in the room, Sarah, on Tuesday, our backs to the panels and our faces to our, our then students, mm -hmm. I remember feeling very much the idea that this is symphonic because it mm -hmm. felt then that I was a part of the symphony mm -hmm. um, being played into this large grand room. And in the Marble Hall itself, a room that I use for performances, it really took on a new meaning for me there on Tuesday. Yeah. And it was interesting too, to uh, in that context, we are able to kind of hear back from visitors and their responses and to sort of receive them. And it, it added to the energy of the piece, it kind of activated it in a way. Um, and I also, I'm intrigued by this idea of motif too. Um, it, and I, and I have a thought too, in terms of the, the art exhibition itself, where the curator has taken this motif of the guitar, this object, and we see it, pardon the pun, playing out throughout um, a swath of art history, of American art history, in which, you know, we can use it to or sort of, as sort of a, a touch point to examine larger themes, um, larger things to think about in terms of the American experience, whether that be um, socioeconomic questions, whether that be um, racial questions, um, ideas about gender. It's, it's just a very rich show and that idea of the motif playing out throughout. I had not thought of that till this morning and we didn't think about that on Tuesday, but that's a really a neat connection to make. Um, we too, uh, Robert and I wanna show you very quickly if I can make this work, I cannot shoot. There it goes. Um, I want to show you the installation of this object. Um, this mural was first conceived by Solowit in 1987 and installed in a gallery in Paris. The museum acquired the object, the piece, in 1999, and it was installed in its current place um, in 1999, but it was removed when the museum underwent an expansion in 2010. And it was just sort of knocked off the walls and thrown away and then reinstalled. And that seems counter to any, anything we would think is okay for caring for an artwork. But in the case of Saul Lewitt and this object and this conceptual art, it's really the idea that is the artwork and the image of it or the, the sort of in the installation of it is um, he sort of he used the word perfunctory it's uh, it's simply evidence that the idea happened I guess you could say um, so I want to show you this very quick video of the installation the second installation in 2009 um, of Solowitz while drawing 541 just to give you a sense of this kind of you know, the symphony at work, I guess, really, Robert, all these people involved, this is not the single hand of the artist. In fact, he is not involved at all. Um, this is a large group of practitioners responding to the directions he has given for the installation of this piece. The rehearsal process, if you will, of putting together the finished product. At the end, we have a symphony. You know, you've talked off top, Sarah, about uh, Lewitt's comments about not knowing how his art will be received once he's put all this work into it. It immediately made mm -hmm. me think of a story about Beethoven writing his Ninth Symphony. Of course, we know very famously by then he, he was struggling with his hearing. Mm -hmm. And when he introduced the world to Symphony Number no. 9, we all love it today, he could not hear the applause and right. immediately assumed that it was not received well until he was turned around and saw that people were on their feet. But you know, we worry when we create art does it, will it make an impact? And if so, what will that impact be? Yeah, and I think um, that's a great segue into our next piece too, because um, I think where Saul LeWitt is asking his audience to really engage in this artwork, kind of on a, on a purely intellectual level where we're, we're kind of thinking about the ways in which these forms are related and kind of puzzling out what's happening with them in terms of space um, and our position at positionality within that space. Um, the next artist, um, and we're gonna jump back about 
40 years uh, to 1947 with um, an artwork that is using a very similar color palette but very different forms and very different art elements. This artist is composing, if you will, in a very different way that we might say is a little bit more masterfully evocative um, and might call upon our, our, our memory and actually a lot of our other senses to respond to these, these elements that he's engaging. Um, so we're gonna jump back about 40 years and look at Jacob Lawrence's Catfish Row from um, 1947. Um, where Lawrence was commissioned uh, by Fortune Magazine, who um, he, had, he had done his, already finished his migration series, which, which I believe was done in 1941. This is after World War II now, this is post-war. Um, he's been invited to go down to the South um, to what the magazine article titled The Black Belt and kind of document the African-American experience in the Deep South with a series of 10 paintings. Uh, this one was not published, only three of the 10 were, um, but we are really lucky to have it in our collection. It's a piece that, um, that uh, as an educator, I use a lot and my colleague uh, who works with me uses a whole lot with students. Um, and Jacob Lawrence himself, um, when he was, speaking about working with students and teaching them about art, he talked about the importance of these kind of elements, these art elements in composing a picture. And he said, um, I, I try to get the student to appreciate form, shape, line, color, texture, and space, regardless of what the content may be. The content can be abstract, it can be figurative. I try to point out there's less chance of your becoming just illustrative when you become involved with these plastic elements. So he really is after using and composing with these with color, line, shape, form in order to evoke a particular feeling. And I'm curious, Robert, um, for you, how that works, how this composition works for you in terms of um, composing or sort of being evocative in the way a piece of music might. You know, we have um, a lot of the elements we talked about before, color, motif, pattern there's a lot of repetition i mm -hmm. see in this piece of music yeah. uh, and improvisation like i said before you know if you start at the bottom left corner we're introduced to the the, the blue note right mm -hmm. and we move next to something that's almost opposite in red and then we have blue again but the blue has changed it's yeah. a very similar blue but it's now a different shape we've improvised what blue means mm. but panel and then we improvise again in the fourth but we pick up a new color a new element that of the yellow that layers onto that um, symphony, I suppose. But this looks more like jazz to me. Yeah. More like soul. I mean, you, you talked at the beginning about evoking different senses. When I look at this piece of music, and perhaps when everyone else looks at this piece, a uh, piece of music, I said music, piece <laughs> of, perhaps when others do, I hear the sound of the plates and I hear the sound of the frying pan. I hear this woman's beautiful bracelet jingling mm -hmm. as she. Yeah engaging with whatever she's meant to eat. But I also now I, I'm smelling hot oil. You know, I'm wondering how hot it is in this room. What's the heat? It, it, soon, I'm not just looking at something, I'm trying to experience it. Yes. On Tuesday, when we had a live crowd in front of us, somebody asked, well, am I supposed to be in this situation or am I observing it from the outside? And yeah. that changes the perspective of it too. Am I an audience member at this concert or am I too performing with them? Right. Um, we think nowadays, I mean, it's not a new idea anymore, but we think of something that we call chance music. And mm -hmm. is in that idea, sure, the person playing Mozart 29 is making the music, but is the audience member who coughed or sneezed is the ambulance driving by with their siren wailing? Is that a part of the music too? It, whether it is or whether it isn't, it certainly is going to um, influence uh -huh. our experience there. And so when we think, when I think about this painting, and I think, am I in it or am I watching? That influences how I'm engaging with these people. I shared yeah. with you, Sarah, that I hear singing immediately when I see this because I see my uncles and my aunts and my great grandmother, and I see them in the kitchen fixing a meal for myself or for the church or for the family 
and they were always singing. Somebody was always tapping their foot. And when I come to this with my, with my personal experience mm -hmm. from life, it's nothing but music for me, even though perhaps Lawrence wasn't thinking about singers or some yeah. young child watching their grandmother cook. I think though, I think you're right. I think when, when we use this work with students, one of the things that have, that comes up over and over and over again is this idea of this layered sensory experience that this piece offers us. And, um, and with respect to this perspective, it's kind of an interesting, it's an odd sort of skewed bird's eye view as if we're sort of swooping into the scene. Um, and, but we're just like, we're just about to, we're joining in, we're about to be part of it. It very much is if you are standing in front of a work of art in the gallery, you know, allowing yourself time to join in is really important. And I feel this one's very invitational in that way, just the way that, that um, Lawrence is using particularly the, this angled line and these kind of very invitational um, lines into the piece and then you're sort of invited right in. And I love that idea of the hot sizzling oil that comes up a lot with students too. So that even if you don't hear singing all the noises that's that are happening while people are eating that kind of rhythm is yeah exactly. Um, and somebody in on Tuesday when we were in the galleries really talked to about body language in this piece and these repeated forms and elbows and angles and she started to move when she was talking about it. She was almost dancing while she was, while she was trying to embody what was being presented to us. Um, yeah, so. This piece yeah. also invites us to kind of travel through time. You know, we're, we're taken back to 1940s Alabama yes. and yep. we're met with a, a scene of black bodies in Alabama in the 1940s. We're not so removed from 1947 that we don't remember stories and moods and situations and traumas that may have been happening, but we're also being told this story with the use of very bright colors. You know, yes. it may not be a very bright story. We, we're we telling with bright stories. I mean, egg tempera is used for the vibrancy of the color that it can show. We mm -hmm. also see contrast in light and dark and the, these people's bodies and the clothes that they're wearing. There's, there's so much to engage with here. Yeah. Um, and that, that time travel, allowing ourselves to experience who we are today and who we once were in a single piece of art is also very powerful, whether musical or not. Yeah, and I think it points to, to, to Lawrence's intention with this piece when he went down to document experience, knowing that it would, that he's bringing it back and hopefully it's going to be published or it's going to be disseminated, this ideas, these ideas. Um, I understand too that he, he wrote labels for these images that were changed a bit by Fortune magazine when they published it. They they were they were muted, Titch. Um, so it's and um, although this piece wasn't published, and this from what I understand, I haven't read it, but from the what I've read about it, this one was a little bit less overtly critical of the experience of. Um, so this may have been slightly more celebratory, I'm not sure, but um, but it was more the case that these images were really critiquing the situation in a much more um, overt way. So yeah, I, I think he definitely is after presenting a particular experience and really heightening it with those colors. And there's, I should, we should mention too, there's, a, there's an object down in the exhibition that's a Jacob Lawrence, um, very similar color palette, different scene altogether. Um, of course, there's a guitar featured, but it also is really great to, if you see that piece down in the exhibition, really take note of how Lawrence is using very intentionally these very simple, these basic art elements to move your eye around the piece, to make you think about the relationship of that guitar with the other people in the scene um, and kind of what it signifies. Um, okay, let's move on so we don't run out of time. Um, we're going to jump back a little bit more even and head to the very beginning of the century with this object by um, Thomas Wilmer doing, and you know what, I, it says 1903, but I think that might be, I think it's 1904, my apologies. Um, it's either 1903 or 1904. Um, 
This is the lute by Thomas Wilmer doing. And as you can see, uh, this is this is the only of our three pieces that has a musical instrument in it. It's not a guitar. Um, and I think you can see that we've we've switched color palettes quite a lot. There, this one's significantly reduced, um, maybe muted. And but I think you probably agree, and if you don't shout out, Robert, that this piece is also evocative um, and sort of sets a mood, but this time, at least to me, like the idea of tone really comes into play. Um, and I don't know if you can comment on that in terms of that idea of tonality um, in a music piece, you in know, a when, composition. When we are composing music, uh, it's, it's common people know that a song is in a particular key. Yeah. But why? Why do we have to have particular keys? Why can't we just play everything in C major? Why does it matter if it's in A minor or D minor? It's because those particular keys do make us feel something. You know, Mozart's um, Mozart's DSE Ray is written in D minor for a reason because it's a very violent key. It's a very contemplative key. Um, Verdi does not write his in D minor because he wants to evoke a different sort of mood, a different mm -hmm. sort of feeling. Uh, we, in music, we use painting as a term, tonal painting is what we call it, to yeah. influence our listener to feel what we're feeling. I think this, I think doing does a great job uh, with setting mood here, but we're left with a lot of questions too, aren't we, Sarah? Who is we really this, are. Mm -hmm. Who is this woman here and why is she there? This painting is called The Lute. There is a lute in it, but she's not playing it. Um, mm -hmm. It just makes, makes you think what is really happening here? What's happening outside of the frame? What aren't we seeing? What's in the room? I challenge you, viewer, whoever you are, I wish I could see you. Um, look at her face. Look at her hands. Look at the way she's sitting. What does it tell us that she's almost the same color as the wall behind her? Mm -hmm. What does it say to us that she's not engaging with this instrument, but the instrument is up on a very uh, intimidating looking table. It's up on a pedestal. Her gown and her feet are touching the floor. She's not really elevated on anything. What's she even doing in the room? I don't know. Um, it makes me, it, I, I shared with you, Sarah, it reminds me of being a prodigy at seven years old and having to be brought into a room and stood by a piano, not knowing what to do. And I did whatever I needed for the three minutes. So I had to sing or something, but now I'm just an ornament. Right. And, and that's the way she looks to me. You know, she maybe, does. Maybe yeah. she played the flute and now she's done. And that's, that's not without intention. And I think too, um, we, we talk about this idea of ton tonality and it's um, this, this, artist Thomas Wilmer doing is also part of and his artwork is very much engaged with the tonalist um, style of painting in the early 20th century in, in the United States and um, very much in response I guess you could say to um, to Whistler I mean we've seen I think a lot of us are familiar with Whistler's um, ideas about paint evoking a certain sort of mood and he likens often um, his pieces to sort of musical um, aspects of, of, of music as well. And here doing, if we kind of go back to our, our thoughts about composition and the way that he's positioned the various objects and elements in this room, you know, it becomes interesting. Um, you kind of can see, so you've got this what we might call kind of an implied line. You've got this line going across, can you see my cursor going across the bottom? So this is the, the floor hitting the um, wall. It goes right across her knees. She almost becomes, I don't wanna say part of the furniture, but it's interesting how that's all carefully lined up. And then you come up here to um, this equivalence of kind of her hands in the end of the lute. And then we have this, line of this very heavy table, the sheen going straight across through her elbow and picking up again at the bottom of this mirror or picture frame or whatever it is. And that kind of sanctions off this upper right quadrant, um, the inhabitants of which are 
the head of or the body of the lute and her head looking as you said Robert sort of inviting us to sort of zone out <laughs> off yeah. of the page in some other area and we don't know is she looking at something or is she very introspective but um this is very a very familiar motif or, or way of building a painting for for doing of and his whole body of work where he might position a model this isn't a particular person but a woman in an interior space looking very relaxed or beautiful but as you aptly noted quite objectified right she is ornament she's not a person in the same way that the lute is an object that's evocative and both of them are meant to conjure up ideas of beauty um, of sort of a poetic past that that lute might bring up ideas of the renaissance for example um, so here um, it's not being played or activated as an instrument, but it is it is there kind of as a motif, if you will, or sort of symbolic of a rec or in remembrance of another time period. Um, it's just all meant to have us just have a very enjoyable, beautiful, ethereal scene to engage with. Um, but it is it in it for, to 21st century eyes, it is highly curious as to what's going on. It's it's hard to make out. Um, I mean it's called the lute. It's not called the woman in the green dress. Clearly, right. she's an ornament. I mean, her body is cut in half. We don't even get her whole body, but we get all of the lute. That's true. Yeah, yeah, she is cut in half, kind of. Um, and it's it's interesting too. The in the exhibition, it goes very deeply into an exploration of interior spaces and women inhabiting them, but the way in which the guitar plays a very different role than this lute happens to be playing here. In some cases, yes, you have women sort of in relaxed positions sitting with guitars in a parlor area or sort of a upper middle class interior. Um, but there are other instances where they are handling and holding. And um, I believe the Leo Maisel uses the term the guitar wielding women in the exhibition. And we're called upon to kind of think about what that does when they're holding and playing and, and being with and sort of um, embracing the instrument, what difference that has to something that, it's a very different feel and um, intentionality than this object has. You know, Sarah, um, that makes me wonder in this moment how I would, how I would respond to this painting where she holding the instrument. Mm -hmm. and it's that I wonder if I would think differently. Yeah, and it's interesting doing doing does have plenty of paintings of women holding lutes, playing pianos. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, though, they have a very similar objectified feel to them, partially because of this overall tonality that he gives the scene, that it's kind of ethereal and um, they don't seem to have a lot of personal character that is, or a agency, I guess. Um, they are kind of more ornamental. Um, it's interesting. So, um, but it is it is interesting too, to think about, you know, back to the exhibition, the way an instrument can, depending on our perception of it, and a guitar, of course, is a very different instrument than a lute. Um, the show has the guitar appearing in spaces as diverse as, as I said, these sort of parlors or interior spaces of upper middle class to obviously the stage, there's some being played in the middle of a field, um, even down to a street corner on the curb, you know, and it shows up in all sorts of spaces um, and has a sort of more, I don't know, dem democratic, I think Leo would argue feel and something as, highfalutin as this loop <laughs> does. Um, yeah. Painting helps me remember too that the role of the musician was very different once. I mean, this these people, whoever they are in the room, don't have the opportunity to pop on Spotify to hear their favorite jam. They've yeah, got to yeah. have somebody who has the skill to play the instrument and perhaps that's who she is today. Yeah. Well, um, I'd be very curious to know, um, you know, we, we presented these three pieces, they're very different, um, but it was interesting to explore them 
within this idea of this framework of composition and those overlaps between sonic and visual communication. Wonderful. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Loved hearing that. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.